This is Anne Molesky from anacoustic.com, and you're listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You're in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher, founder of Musical You, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today I'm joined by Anne Molesky of Anacruzic.com and the Anacruzic Podcast. Anne is trained in several of the musicianship approaches we've covered here on the show before, including Could I, Orf, Dal Crows, Music Learning Theory, and more. And her mission is to make music teaching as purposeful, sequential, and joyful as possible for music teachers everywhere. Anne really stands out as someone who draws on each of those approaches to musicianship training to develop her own very well thought out material. And she shares this with other music teachers through in-person workshops, as well as her popular website and podcast. I really enjoyed getting the chance to talk to Anne about her experience and observations of the various approaches to musicianship training, and I'll throw in my normal disclaimer that although some of the specifics we'll be talking about are geared towards music teachers and early childhood music education, if you are an adult and or a student yourself, keep listening. There are plenty of insights and valuable nuggets in here for you. We talk about Anne's own musical upbringing and a few key experiences, both positive and negative, which influenced her own musicality and how she approaches her teaching. We talk about the relative strengths of Kodai, Orf, Dalcros, and music learning theory. And Anne shares about the importance of sequencing in teaching and learning, and the two timescales you need to be thinking about for designing effective music learning sequences. Anne is a great storyteller, and I know her stories will resonate with you, as well as her insights on singing, sequencing, improvising, and more. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical You. Welcome to the show, Anne. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. So you specialize in early music education, and I would love to hear about your own early music education. Was it so good or so bad that it inspired you to go into this area yourself? Oh my gosh, that's such a loaded question. So <laughs> so my early musical background in terms of school music is memorable in bits and pieces, but is very different from the way that I teach as an early childhood music teacher. So um, the biggest influence in my life was actually my father. I grew up in a really, really musical family. My dad was a high school band director, a composer. um, And so I grew up in this really rich environment of musical everything all the time. Um, And so I grew up as a trumpet player and singing in a university children's choir and taking piano lessons from the time I was four until I graduated high school. And, um, I felt really, really moved by music. I felt like that was a huge part of who I was. And then when I went to college, I decided I wanted to do something totally different. And (laughs) that completely bombed because when I got to college, I just was a total fish out of water. I felt really, really uncomfortable and like I... I couldn't find my way because I wasn't doing anything with music. So after my first semester at university, I transferred into the music school at the University of Michigan with my trumpet. And so um, from there, I trained to be a professional trumpet player. It was my goal to be a trumpet player in an orchestra. And moving through undergraduate studies, I decided to go do a master's in trumpet performance. And it was in my master's program that I actually met a wonderful elementary music pedagogue by the name of Julie Scott. And she kind of showed me what elementary music could be, because I thought if you were going to be a music teacher, it meant you were going to be a band director. (laughs) And while I had like lived that life and it was a wonderful life and lots of cool things that my dad got to do and I got to do as a student of his, it wasn't what I wanted to be doing. And so once I got a little bit of a glimpse at how rich elementary music could be and how um, it could impact kids in a lot of different ways outside of just 
musically um, and then having the opportunity to work in some preschools and some early childhood situations, I just really sort of found my footing there. So it was a little bit of a curvy path <laughs> to get to to being a, a childhood music teacher. But um, I would definitely say that the influence of just growing up in that musical environment and having the experience to be really um, proficient on my instrument sort of paved the way for where we are today. So. Interesting. Well, I definitely want to come back in a minute and talk about what she showed you that opened your eyes to what early music education could be and compared with your expectations. But first, let's let's go back a little bit because you mentioned, you know, your memories are, you, you've got little bits and pieces of what the journey was like for you and you just said it was a bit curvy. So I'd love to ask, you know, what were the other um, memorable phases or moments um, for you developing as a musician before you went down this path of becoming a teacher? You mean growing up like in my school years? Yeah, or? What, what kind of musician were you or what was the music learning experience like for you? You know, we've had guests on this podcast who just learned playing in their church gospel band, others who were learning sheet music note by note, some who are very music theory oriented, others who are, you know, on the jazz improv end of the spectrum. What, what was that like for you? What was your music education like? Well, to be very honest with you, it was very formalized in the sense that it was very reading notation driven, I guess. That's not a very clear way to say it, but um, I remember, and my brothers would admit to this too, um, we were all great readers. So we were great sight readers. So, you know, you have a week in between your piano lessons and then, you know, your piano lessons on Tuesday. So Monday night, you're reading through everything <laughs> so that you can go into your piano lesson and make it through, right? And of course, the teacher always knows as they always do, but um but I remember kind of relying on that and not being able to play by ear very well at all, to be very honest with you, um, through, um, throughout my like high school days. Um, so when I got to college, I um, kind of continued along that trajectory. And it was really reflective in my playing to the point where my undergraduate teacher, there were a couple of experiences I remember particularly with this, but my undergraduate teacher um, one day in my lesson said, you can't hear anything that you're playing. And I just, you know, kind of got very quiet and was thinking, yeah, that's definitely true. I'm just pressing buttons and <laughs> looking at the notes. And um, he's like, so you need to sign up for the jazz lab band. And I just looked <laughs> at him like he was crazy because I was not, I mean, it, at my university, it was very much, um, there are a couple of people who did both jazz and classical, but it was very direct road. Like if you were in this studio, you were going to be a classical trumpet player in an orchestra or a military band or something like that. And if you were in this studio, then you were a jazz player. And the two very rarely crossed because the the teacher for the classical studio didn't really dabble in jazz at all, um, unless it was in an orchestral context, but that's a different story. Anyway, so he had me sign up for the lab band, and I remember there was one day that... <laughs> The, and the and the director knew that I was I was Anne in this box that had not played jazz ever in her entire life, and so he just went around the room one day to improvise, and it got to me, and I literally could not play anything. I literally like I was just like I can't do this. Like I I was like pass. Like somebody else can go now. And he just kind of looked at me and then moved on, and that was the end of it. But you know, obviously that's something that stuck with me. It's been over what fifteen years now longer than that since that happened. And, um, you know, that looking back, that's, that's really kind of sad <laughs> in a way, because I should have, I should have tried something, but I was so in my head and so about making things right that I, there was no way I was even going to try. And, and, you know, playing by ear is really having, um, a good idea of the context of, of the musical situation that you're in. And and being able to sort of process what you want something to sound like before it it comes out, right? That's how I think about it. And for me, even practicing excerpts, practicing orchestral excerpts, practicing more of these well-known classical things, there are times that I would have a really good aural picture of what something should sound like before I play, but then there are other times that I didn't. And um, that's something that my master's degree teacher told me. I was playing a really complicated 
almost atonal etude in one of my lessons. And he kind of pulled the same thing on me. He's like, you have no idea what you're playing. And I was just like, yeah, that's true. He's like, go to the practice room, sit at the piano, and you need to be able to sing this before you can play it. And I did that. And then I came in and he was like, okay, now we're talking, like, here's the next one. <laughs> like, and now we can check that off. So, so I hope that answers your question. I, I think that um, for me, improvisation is something that still does not come naturally on my instrument. Um, because I honestly think that that is an extra step. Um, it's something that now after doing lots of elementary music pedagogy training and, um, thinking about how to teach it to kids comes much more naturally to me in terms of singing. And I am not a classically trained singer. I'm trained to the standpoint that I teach children to sing, but I mean, I would never go audition for an opera or something. Um, but, but that's more natural because of the way that your brain processes music and being able to sing something is very different than being able to process something and then put it on an instrument because there's an extra step there. So. Very good. I am going to add that to the list of things to circle back to in a moment. Um, that okay. singing <laughs> improvisation. I, I love the way you talk there about how playing by ear works and what, and, and the nuance of improvising because as you say, you know, it is an internal and an external skill. It's not just magic on your fingers on the instrument. Um, first, you mentioned a couple of really memorable experiences there that were both, I, I think, kind of a, a a blow by the sounds of it. Like emotionally, <laughs> yeah. that, that, that was hard advice to hear. Like I, it, it did, clearly did you favors in the sense that it opened up your ears and you put in the effort to live up to what your teachers were saying you could do. But at the same time, that's not the most encouraging, but you clearly, you had a great trajectory through music and into becoming a teacher. So were there any kind of um, counterbalancing experiences that encouraged you that, yes, you know, you were becoming a good musician. You were someone who was cut out for this. Yeah, absolutely. I think that first I want to address what you said. So yes, they were definitely blows, but bear in mind that I was training for a situation where if you don't go into an orchestra audition and play perfect, you're not even considered. I mean, it's not just playing, you know what I mean? It's not just playing the right notes, playing the right rhythms. It's a lot more beyond that, but that's the first step. So that's, you know, and th there were days that I would leave a lesson crying, <laughs> but, but I always learn something from the situation. So there's that. But there absolutely were counterbalancing moments. So when I was in high school, you know, I mentioned earlier how I kind of pushed back against this whole idea of being a musician. And, and largely because that was what everybody expected out of me. And it's what I was always good at. And since I felt like I was always good at it, I wanted to try something different, which maybe seems weird. But it's like, oh, but I'm also good at like school and I like math and science. So let's go do the same. But anyway... So um, I remember when I was in high school, I was a sophomore. So I was in my second year of high school and, um, in the United States and in, in the state of Michigan, where I grew up, um, they do these proficiency tests. And what it entails is you play a solo and then you play scales and you do sight reading and, um, and they give you a numerical score out of 100, essentially. And I got a 99 on my first proficiency. And, and for me, it was, like I said, I was a really good reader. And it was the first, like, level of performance, um, like, in this competition. So the sight reading was fairly accessible. Um, and the reason I missed the point is because I didn't do a trill. Because in my brain, <laughs> I was trying to remember, like, my piano background got the best of me. And I was trying to remember if the trill should start on the note above or the note that it was written. And so I was like, oh, I'm just going to skip it. <laughs> So I lost I love that you but remember anyway. that all these years later, oh, yeah. that one point. I, that one <laughs> point. But anyway, it's okay. I never got as good of a score like in my later years. But anyway, I remember I was outside after and the man who had judged me knew my father because he was a, a band director as well. But he was kind of standing over by the window. This is very vivid in my brain. And um, he kind of gave me that come here motion with his finger. And I walked over and I don't remember the exact conversation, but it was essentially like, what are your plans in four years when you graduate and this is what you need to be doing? And I was just kind of like, okay. Like I was what, 14, 15. I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow, <laughs> let alone like what I'm doing in four years. Right. When it comes to trumpet. Um, but that really stuck with me. And then the fact that somebody no noticed that, like, I just sort of had this natural, you know, I don't, I, 
resist the word talent a little bit. I mean, that's a whole other podcast, but, um, but just this norm, natural inclination that it came naturally to me and that if I really, really fostered it, it would probably be something, something great. And so there was that moment. And then also the same moment that my trumpet teacher, um, an undergrad, well, actually, this is a different moment. He, he assigned me a very difficult etude. And it was when I was getting ready to do master's auditions. And I was always pretty good because I got by. And I, I've never really loved practicing. I love playing. I love going and sitting in orchestra. I love you know, sitting in a brass quintet. I love doing all of those things, but sitting in a practice room with a timer for five hours was never my jam. And so when it came time to audition for master's programs, I got really motivated because I had that goal. And so he assigned me a brand new A2 that was really, really difficult. And I think he thought it was going to take a couple weeks to get it under my belt. And I walked into my lesson and if I can be so bold, like I totally nailed the snot out of it. Like I, I did, I played it really, really well. And he just like looked at me and pushed back his chair. And he said, you mean to be telling me you can play like that. And I haven't heard you play like that for the last three years. <laughs> I was just like, oh, <laughs> like, like I've wasted some time, you know? So from that point on, I, I, um, I mean, it was rare to get a compliment from, from him like that. At least, I mean, obviously, cause I wasn't practicing the way I should have been for the last three years, but I mean, he was a very, very caring teacher. I love, um, Bill Campbell at the University of Michigan. He is an amazing man. He really, really cares about his students more than just as trumpet players, just as people like we were really a family. And, um, but it was rare to get a compliment like that because he was honest. And unless it was really, really good, he wasn't going to tell you that it was really, really good. But that day he told me it was really, really good. And I rode that high, like all the way through my graduate school auditions. And I, you know, and so having that positive experience where I just worked, you know, my behind off and then got that positive feedback and then went on to do fairly well with graduate auditions. I mean, that was a big, big turning point for me where I was like, oh, like this is something I can, I can actually do. You know, if I put in the time, if I really, really want it, if I'm working toward this goal, this is definitely something that I can do. Fantastic. Well, I, I think that gives me a much better sense of where you're coming from as a musician. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And um, I... I want to come back to, uh, I'm sorry, I forget her name, but you had a, a pedagogue who was particularly um, inspirational for you. And you said she showed you what early music education could be like. So now that we have that sense of who you were at the point where you were like, maybe I'll become a music teacher. What were your kind of mental notions of early music education? And what did she show you that changed that perspective? Yes. Yeah, so, um, I'd be so interested to talk to you at a later date about what like the early music, um, education is, is sort of like outside of the United States. Cause I'm just very ignorant when it comes to that, just to be really honest. But for, um, for me and for a lot of people sort of my age, when you talk to somebody about their elementary music class, they remember the musicals they put on and play in the recorder. Those are like the <laughs> two things that everybody remembers. And to me, I might not make friends by saying this. Those are my two least favorite things <laughs> about teaching elementary music. Like, I think that recorder can be done really, really beautifully. But at the same time, like, it's just not like my most favorite thing. Um, but anyway, so that's what most people remember. And so I remember that too. I remember, you know, going to the lunchroom because that's the only place we had for a music room and in my elementary school and sitting on the benches and we would either be playing BAG on the recorder. We would be singing along to the pre-recorded music for the musical, <laughs> or we would be um, singing out of the textbooks and, you know, the music textbooks that big companies here, like Pearson puts out or Pearson, I might be misspeaking, like Silver Bird and Making Music. I don't, maybe those are owned by Pearson. I don't know. Anyway. So I remember also like reading the textbooks um, and singing along and just kind of, you know, following the ups and downs and all that kind of stuff. And for me, you know, kind of doing the monkey see, monkey do, whatever, you know, singing, singing first of all, let's say this, singing first of all, no matter how you're doing it, I think kids love to sing. 
and they love to sing in a community setting. So if you're in a, you know, when you get on a bus, what do kids start doing? They start singing songs. So on a field trip or whatever else. So I think that's just part of what they do and on the playground and all that good stuff. However, I think that in a music teaching environment, there are things we can do beyond sitting and singing from a textbook or singing along with pre-recorded music or, um, or just kind of playing fingerings on a recorder instead of knowing what the notes are. And so that was my image of elementary music. Like that's not what sticks out in my brain about what formed me as a musician. I think about the children's chorus experiences that I had where we were treated like musicians real musicians who needed to practice their music and we went on tour and we did recordings. And I mean, that's like a very, a very special experience. Not everybody would have something like that, but that really kind of gave me an idea of what, what, um, what you could do with kids. I mean, I was in fifth grade when I was in that ensemble and got to do those sorts of things. So anyway, so my picture of elementary music was very, very limited, I guess. And when I went to um, Southern Methodist University, I met Julie Scott. And I was actually, even though I was a trumpet player, I was randomly assigned to the music ed department for my teaching assistantship, <laughs> like to help them with things. And at that time, Dr. Scott was working on her doctorate. She was working on her dissertation. So she had finished all her doctoral coursework and she was back to teach and still working on her dissertation. And her dissertation was all about orchestral work and the role of singing within orchestral work. And so through that, I was, I was talking to her about all of these different people she had interviewed in the field and, and their take on what elementary music is like. And then I was also, you know, helping sift through different choral octavo, octavos, excuse me, that were unison or two parts. So things that I sang when I was in children's choir and remembering all of these things. And just, it was kind of this wash of, of stuff that just made me think like, oh, this is so fun. And in the meantime, I had, there was an undergraduate in the trumpet studio who was an ed major. And she was in her methods class. So she would, we'd be sitting at lunch and she'd be doing her homework. And I'm like, oh, that game looks like so much fun. And you're using it to teach this. So I just like sort of had my eyes wide opened for me, I guess, um, to realize that elementary music is not just sitting and singing, you know, which I think, which is so crazy to hear myself say that because I mean, how, how many years have I been doing this? And up until the point that I really started doing it, that's what I thought it was. Um, and I think that that is a very common misconception because a really, really great elementary music teacher is somebody who is not only helping to build skills for children in terms of literacy skills and all of that kind of stuff, but also somebody who is taking the time to really, really build um, community and build self-efficacy, positive self-efficacy, um, and all of those things when it comes to doing music, but also applying that outside of the music classroom. And very little of that has anything to do with sitting and reading music. <laughs> a lot of it has to do with everything else, right? So, um, yeah, that was just meeting her was, you know, if I had to name one of the five influential people in my life, she would be right up there because I wouldn't be a music teacher if I wouldn't have met her. I see. And so you were exposed to offshore work. You decided that mm -hmm. was the be all and end all. It solved all of your problems <laughs> and you went on to become an off music teacher for the rest of your life. No, not even a little bit. So, <laughs> so um, I was at the same time I was doing my master's degree. I was also teaching a part time early childhood music. And uh, the lady that I was working with doing that was a very, very Kodai inspired music teacher. And so the books that she gave me, so I knew what in the world I was teaching, were the Lois Choksi books, the Kodai Contracts and the Kodai Method. And, you know, that gives you the sequencing and everything else for what to teach. I'm um, not that Orff Schulwerk does it. I'm not saying that in the slightest, but um, it's a little bit, you can find resources that are more prescribed. We'll say it that way, that that have the title Kodai inspired Um That's stuff we can get into in a minute <laughs> about how I feel about that. Um, <laughs> but... Um, but yeah, so I, I knew about Orff Schulwerk. I knew about Kodai. I knew that there are lots of these different sort of pedagogical approaches to teaching um, elementary general music. And I knew that none of them included just sitting and singing. And I think that that was the big, the big eye-opening. Gotcha. And a... Yeah, without going down a, a rabbit hole of what things are like in the UK and my own early music experiences, I, I think, you know, that your description of it as sitting and singing or playing the recorder 
unfortunately covers a lot of it in a lot of countries. And so it's interesting that there were those two pedagogical approaches that specifically opened your mind to what was possible. And I know that you've also become a Dalcro's practitioner in some regards. And I've also, I think, seen mention on your blog of music learning theory and um, the, the various aspects of that. So I'd love to ask you, because there aren't many music teachers I've met who have explored each of those to a, a decent standard. And so I'd love to hear your perspective on how they all relate or don't, how they fit together. You clearly, I, I gather you're not someone who is like, Orf is everything, no. Kodai is everything, no. Dalgros is everything, and switched. So you have found a way to kind of reconcile them and draw on each. Um, maybe you could just talk about what you see as the strengths or what people misunderstand about each of them if they think it has to be all or nothing choosing one. Yeah, so that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, there's a really, really wonderful text, if anybody's interested, called Teaching General Music, um, Approaches, Issues, and Viewpoints, I believe with the subtitle. And it's edited by Dr. Brent Galt and Dr. Carlos Abril. Dr. Galt is Professor of Music Education at Indiana University, and Dr. Abril is Professor of Music Education at the University of Miami in Florida. And they are both wonderful, wonderful pedagogues, and they edited this book and brought together sort of their dream team um, when it comes to all of the different things that you need to think about and all the different things that you need to consider when it comes to teaching general music. And within this book, they have experts on Kodai. They have experts on Delcros, on um, Orf Schulwerk, on music learning theory, and world music pedagogy, on constructivist teaching. I mean, anything you can think of. Um, It's a pretty pretty dense text and pretty comprehensive. So that's a good resource for anybody because I am not the expert, (laughs) I wouldn't necessarily say. So if I had to put myself in a box, which I violently oppose and don't like labels, believe it or not, but if I had to be pinned down to be put in in a box, I would definitely say that I am predominantly a Kodai-inspired teacher. I don't really make any bones about that. And the reason why is because because of, in a way, sort of that prescribed sequencing that I talked about. And prescribed isn't the right word. However, when you first begin to get into Kodai-inspired teaching or you get into getting Kodai certified, at least in the United States, um, there is a very, very good example of what a sequence would look like. And some people take that to be the prescription and other people say, no, this is the example. Here is the essence of what it is. Now I can take it and apply it to my situation, which is the whole point. (laughs) So that's a big misconception that it is prescribed um, because a lot of the things that you see in textbooks or in training courses is that example because when people go to training courses or get textbooks, they want to see something that they can immediately apply. But the whole idea is that you see how to take repertoire and how to take that repertoire and develop a an instructional sequence that relates directly to the repertoire that you're using in the place that you're living with the culture of your students and all that kind of stuff. It's it's hard to wrap up in a pretty little box in a hot minute. But anyway, <laughs> so there's that. Um, or if tool work really has to do with Um, finding ways to explore different musical concepts in terms of of creativity. Um, And so you see that throughout what would be considered a learning sequence, um, which in Kodai terms is generally taking a concept and preparing it, presenting it, and then practicing it. The um, Orf work takes that maybe that process and improvisation is in there throughout. So the student has more opportunity to have their own um, definitions of whatever and their own ideas validated and their own um, sort of musicianship come into play throughout the process. Um, So it it may be considered more student driven, but I would argue that there's Kodai teachers who who do that really beautifully. Um, I am of the opinion that Kodai inspired teaching is not just about reading and writing, but I think people get really, really bogged down with that because it is so literacy based. Um, but I think that all approaches have that literacy component. It just maybe seems a little bit more clearly delineated in Kodai inspired teaching. Um, so I think that if you can take the Kodai process and infuse some of the ORF work inspired student agency along with the different ORF media, which is speech, singing, instruments, and movement, 
which allows each student to be their most musical selves, then then you have a really, really beautiful package there. And then, of course, Del Crows is, is a big part of that movement piece. So what I love about Del Crows is that or work, when I first started doing my training, I think people are either really, really drawn to movement or they're really, really afraid of it. And so, um, you know, I was really drawn to it, but I felt like I didn't know enough about it and how to use it really purposefully. And while Orf's tool work allowed for a peek into that, going on to do some Del Crows training gave me more tools in my toolbox, essentially, to be able to bring that effectively to children and to teachers. So um, so I think that that is also a nice little piece. The last one that I got training within that I have the least amount of experience with is music learning theory. But what I love about music learning theory is Edwin Gordon really focused on approaching music as a language. And so it's lots and lots and lots of speaking before you read and write and experimenting and sort of this oral aural idea where you're speaking and listening. And so what's great about that is sort of like Orf Schul work, improvisation is in there throughout. And it's it's getting in there and processing and then processing what you're thinking and hearing and the context and then putting it out into the universe, I guess. It's very difficult to explain. It's very, very heady, <laughs> music learning theory is. It's, I'm still working on that one. Um, but, you know, I think that, to be very honest with you, any of those tools can work together really, really beautifully. And it depends on the teacher and their situation and where they're teaching and the kids that they have and the concept that they're working on or the repertoire that they're using that's going to dict how they teach music. And it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with whether they're an ORF teacher or a Kodai teacher or a music learning theory teacher or a Delcros teacher. It just has to do with being a good teacher. And if you can use some of those tools that come from those different approaches that's great. Um, and the more you know, the more you know, and the more you can do for your kids. So I always like to say, you know, yes, if you had to pin me down, I am predominantly a Kodai Inspire teacher just because I I thrive on that structure. I thrive on that that framework and being able to be flexible within it. Um, and, you know, I'm more mostly active, maybe. I'm as active in the Kodai world as I am in the Orbital work world, but I do teach training courses for <laughs> Kodai. So maybe, maybe I wear that hat a little bit more frequently. Um, but I like to say that I'm not a Kodai teacher. I'm a music teacher. So, I mean, I don't teach Kodai to kids. I teach music to kids. So that's a very long-winded explanation. <laughs> it was a fantastic explanation. Thank you. And yeah. um, depending on how familiar our listeners are already with each of those, I know they will have drawn a lot from your insights there. I did want to pick up on a couple of things you mentioned. Um, one was, if you wouldn't mind just briefly explaining the Kodai principle of preparing as the first step in a process of learning a new concept. Uh, I think that's something that our listeners might not have come across before. Yeah, so if you think about preparation, um, present, and practice, those are sort of the three the three Ps. Um, you know, people have variants of it, and they add an assessment at the end, or they have different, you know, I sort of have my own terminology that is outside of the Kodai framework. But if you're talking specifically about a Kodai-inspired teacher that you find in sort of that realm of the world, Prepare, present, practice. Prepare is the whole idea of singing a song, playing a game, doing some sort of, you know, iconic representation if you're talking or um, learning theory type stuff um, so that students can orally, visually, and kinesthetically understand a concept before they're asked to name it. So the preparation phase is really sort of, sort of the exploration phase. That's the term that I like to use because you're having them – having them being students work within the context of a concept without really knowing what it is in terms of a literacy component. So for me, when you get to the present moment, you know, the idea is that the teacher is presenting this to the students. Well, in my opinion, the students have already learned it. You're just naming it for them. So in the process of presenting or naming something, they get to see the formal terminology, the formal notation, and then they'll probably practice reading and writing it. And then when you go on to the practice phase, that's when they can really apply all of that exploration and all of that, um, the literacy components to new experiences. So practicing, creating, you know, the higher level practice activities like improv and composition, all of that type of stuff. Cool. So you and I were talking briefly before we hit record about 
you know, the, the differences between children learning and adults learning. And I think this is a nice case because when you're teaching children music, I think you get to start with a blank slate to a large extent. So you get to start in that um, prepare phase. And what we find when people come to us at Musical U, they often think they're starting from scratch. But essentially, we have to explain to them, no, you've already done all of that preparation. You know, you already know what a one four five chord progression sounds like, for example. And so actually, our work is really in the kind of presenting and practicing stages of mastering the skills and really knowing mentally what's going on. But a lot of the internal work has been done. So I always find it really interesting to look at teachers such as yourself and how you design things because you're starting from the very beginning, but you're working through each of those phases. One thing that I wanted to pick up on too was you mentioned sequencing when you were talking about the different approaches. And I know that's a, a particular strength of yours as a curriculum designer. I wonder if you could just explain what is sequencing to a music teacher and where does this come up? Yeah, so I think about it, there's sort of two different ones. There's a macro sequence sequence and a micro sequence. So macro sequencing has to do with what you're going to teach kids from the moment they come in your classroom at the beginning of the year through the end of the year, or through the end of their time with you, which for me, I see my kids all, from kindergarten to fifth grade. And so the idea of how are you going to build com concepts from the simple to the complex. So when kids come to me in kindergarten, the very first thing they have to do is sing. You know, they have to learn to be musical if they haven't grown up in a family um, where they sing songs or play games or that type of thing. Um, so finding their singing voice and study beat because everything is built upon those two things. They can't do anything with melody or, um, you know, chord progressions later on in life or anything else if they don't have some sort of of musical musical instrument, I guess. And, you know, I mean, singing is their first and best musical instrument. So that's where we start. And then when it comes to study beat, that's the foundation for anything rhythmic. So that's where we start. And then from there, you build upon whatever whatever will be the next smallest scaffold, I guess. So the next the next building block in a sequence. So for me, I go from steady beat to faster and slower, right? Because there's fast, fast steady beat and a slow steady beat and all that kind of stuff. And it goes on and on and on and on building from the simple to the complex. So that's the idea of a macro sequence. When you get to micro sequencing, that tends to be a little bit trickier because I think um, largely, at least in my experience, there's there's some variation, but there are probably about two or three different sequences that I think most educators could agree are good for, for kids to learn music in terms of concepts, right? Like some people say you should start with these melody, like you should start with do, re, mi instead of so, mi. Like there's all that kind of silly banter that goes on. And it's not silly because people are very passionate about it. I have an opinion. Most teachers do. But at the same time, like as long as you have a solid macro sequence, it really doesn't matter where you start as long as you stay with that trajectory. Anyway, so the micro sequencing is a little trickier because you're talking about how you you start with steady beat, how you how you even begin to present that to kids so that they can master that concept before you move on to the next. So for me, when it comes to micro sequencing, I think about how you a learning sequence in terms of a specific concept and how I'm going to as a teacher, gather resources. So that means like, okay, what songs, what games, what activities can I bring to my students to help them be their most musical selves? So it might be a singing game. It might also be an instrument activity. It might also be a dance or a movement activity. You know, whatever I think will help um, as many students as possible sort of get into the next phase, which is exploration. So that's the whole idea of the aural visual kinesthetic prep, right? The, the whole idea of letting them experience and and sort of speak the musical language before we get to the discovery moment, which is that literacy component. So saying, okay, we did all this stuff with this thing. Now here's what you were doing. Here, here is the thing that you're actually exploring. And then moving on to um, extension, which is that practice phase. So they get to take all of the experience that you've given them Right. So you've built sort of that schema or that that knowledge context 
as well as the literacy components, combining the two to apply to a new context. And then from there, whatever they're able to extend or whatever they're able to create with, you turn into a sharing moment because music is meant to be shared. So whether it's within the context of a class or with parents or the community, um, and then taking some time to reflect on that experience in terms of a lot of different things, but but also how it pertained to the actual concept that you were sequencing through. Very cool. I, I think that's a, a super valuable mental model for people to have as they're exploring music. I think a, a lot of us instinctively think about that macro sequencing of taking a course or figuring out what I'm going to work on this year. But I think very few of us really pause to wonder about the micro sequencing and actually how am I approaching this thing and what is a logical progression. I wonder if we could just take a, an example and briefly talk through what that would look like, if there's a particular skill or topic where you could explain what each of those stages might involve. Yeah, sure. So um, just really quickly, if I think about just taking, we call it ta and TT. So if you're taking quarter note into eighth notes in kindergarten, right, the end of kindergarten for me. Um, so maybe I have a game, a singing game where they're um, – they're singing a song with those two rhythms. So like apple tree is the classic example around here. So, you know, apple tree, apple tree, over and over. You know, it's kind of that tee tee ta rhythm. Um, and they play a game with it. Then maybe they'll take that same song and after they play the game, they'll put the song in their head, but they'll play the rhythm on rhythm six. So they'll play the way the words go, right? That's how we present it to little kids because they're not thinking about rhythm necessarily. And so it'll just be and then so on and so forth. Um, and then maybe they'll step that in their feet. So now they've had the RL, oh, they'll step it in their feet, okay? So they'll go um, tip to walk, tip to walk. And then maybe we'll put um, some icons on the board. So that's like sort of the immediate preparation to, to that literacy component. So there'll be two apples for apple and then one apple for tree and then two apples for apple and then one apple for tree. So that kind of sets them up RLE visually and kinesthetically, right? So they've had all of those preps I was like a super fast rundown of <laughs> all of those preps um, going into, well, okay, now we have these apples on the board. Here's what musicians call this. And you're real musician. So here's our TT, which is two eighth notes. And here's our ta. And then they go on to read it. Um, so that's, I mean, that's all that the discovery or the present moment really is. It's really just saying, here's what you were doing. Here's what it's called. Here's what it looks like. And then you instantly move on to the practice phase. I mean, it's just super duper quick if you've built that context. Um, so then moving on, um, uh, you can have them take apple and tree because that went over and over and over again and have them read different patterns, right? And then translate translate that into TT and Ta, and then maybe they start making their own patterns. Then maybe they make a 4B pattern, or maybe they make an 8B pattern. Then maybe they share it with a friend, and they put their two patterns together to make a longer piece. Um, so then there's your extension. And then they go on to, they play that, um, those patterns that they combine together for the class, or maybe that turns into something that you record and put on a, like a class blog or something. And then, so now they've shared it and they have the opportunity to watch it back and then reflect about what they did and make decisions about whether they liked it, whether they didn't like it. Maybe they could notate it if it wasn't notated before. And I mean, the opportunities are endless, <laughs> you know? So, um, but, but the whole idea of just giving them, like I said, as many opportunities as possible to explore something orally, visually, and kinesthetically. Um, and, and it can be as basic as what I just said, you know, putting it in their feet. Um, you know, obviously, as kids get older, there's ways to incorporate more creative movement and maybe not so so overt, like put the TT toe on your feet. Um, but but finding ways to do it orally, visually, kinesthetic, giving them that literacy component, and then instantly moving on to the opportunity where they can be the music makers, where you're not necessarily just spoon feeding them. Wonderful, thank you. That was a, a perfect illustration I think of why that kind of framework is valuable because if you said to an average music teacher teach them quarter notes and eighth notes that is you know there's a lot to think through whereas I think when you have that step-by-step -step process in mind it's a lot easier to be like oh we could do this here and that there and and build it up bit by bit. That's one of the struggles too is I think especially for new teachers if you're not thinking necessarily this specifically and this intentionally and this sequentially <laughs> about, about how you're going to approach a concept, it's really easy to just throw up a quarter note and two eighth notes and say, this is what this is called. Now let's do it. But if you haven't 
if you haven't given kids or adults or anybody an opportunity to sort of play with something first, um, I mean, that's, they can turn to turn out to be good readers, but they won't be able to play by ear. Kind of like what happened. Let's bring it full circle. So, um, I, I think that that's what, what ends up happening a lot of times just because, and it's not, it's not because those teachers are bad teachers. It's just, it's an awareness issue. And so I think if you can find as many ways as possible to approach music like a language in the sense that you are giving, you know, my one-year-old, she's babbling like crazy right now. She knows exactly what she's saying. I haven't got a clue because she hasn't gotten that, that formal, that formal thing happening yet until she sees the cat and she goes kitty. Right. So I, 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 I think that the more opportunities you give them to play and babble and experience things before you put it in a box, and then also once you put it in that box, giving them the opportunity to make it their own. I think it's really, really important. So, Fantastic. Well, on that note of putting things in boxes, I did definitely want to come back to something you said, which was when people come into your classroom, when kids come into your classroom, they have to sing. And I know that some of our listeners, even just hearing that the kids were going to have to sing, they will have tensed up and they will have been like, oh, can't sing. <laughs> so I wonder if we could just talk a little bit about that. And specifically, you know, you mentioned a couple of times there, kids love to sing and they sing naturally. And that is generally the case, and particularly at the younger ages. But I think it's come up several times on this podcast with guests from different countries. Like there is this cultural thing of at a certain point, your class or your teacher or your friends decide you can or you can't sing and you get put in that box and that's that for the rest of your life. And of course, we, you know, we've talked a bit about this on the podcast before and, you know, the complete nonsense that that, that is and what you can do about it. But I'd love to hear, I guess, a couple of things. One is what you do to head it off at the pass and avoid that happening in the first place. And I guess the second is if a kid comes into your classroom and they're already in that mental state of I'm, I'm too shy or too nervous to sing or I don't think I can sing, is there anything you can do to kind of help them onto the right track? Yeah. So before that, can I, do you mind if I tell a quick story? Please do, yeah. So um, for me, performance anxiety, and I won't go down a huge rabbit hole, but performance anxiety has always been a little bit of an issue for me. Not when it comes to playing trumpet, not when it comes to playing piano, but always when it came to singing. So growing up, I loved singing. I often say that if I would have had the opportunity to have a really, really awesome musical theater program in high school, I probably like would have tried to go to college for that. <laughs> but anyway, just because I love it. And um, I remember growing up, I was in children's chorus, but I remember I one year was singing for a school variety show. And the jazz band was playing and I was singing. And the whole week of rehearsals of our tech week, like it went great and I loved it. I was having so much fun. And then something happened the opening night because it was a three night show. The opening night that I was on stage and the band started and I froze. And I mean, I couldn't run off the stage. <laughs> like there, there I was in my dress with my microphone with the jazz band behind me. And I, so I suffered through it and it was awful. And um, I got a letter from a lady that, um, was a member of our church later in that week um, that said that she was working in the school because she was also a teacher and she was working in the school and she heard somebody singing one night and she came in and it was me and she was so impressed because she had never heard me sing like that. Not to say that I'm so wonderful, but any, anyway, so she had just never heard me sing like that. And then, so she was really exciting for opening night. And then she came and she noticed that I really struggled and she didn't say it like that, but she said, being a singer myself, I know that whatever you were dealing with in terms of laryngitis or whatever, you know, cause that's what it sounded like. I was croaking like a frog. I was so stinking nervous. And, um, she said, whatever that was, like, I've been there. Like, I know what that's like, and you need to keep going. And so, gosh, talking to you today, Chris, I, like, feel like I need to write all these <laughs> moments down that have happened <laughs> throughout the last several years because there's some good stuff in there. But anyway, um, <laughs> but, she, um, but she wrote me that letter, and, I mean, that's obviously stuck with me as well. And so the thing is, is that something my trumpet teacher told me to, and I'm just, I'm speaking to this because if there are people who are listening and who are nervous about singing or say they can't sing, I, I violently reject that because everybody can sing. We're all born with a voice. It's just that we have allowed our adult psyche to get into our head about singing. And my trumpet teacher told me when it came to trumpet auditions, because I used to be nervous about like orchestra auditions, obviously, and most, most of the time, those are behind a screen, right? They put up the screen so it's blind. 
And he said, you know, I've sat on those committees before and everybody sitting on that committee wants you to come in and do an amazing job. They want to find this amazing player. They want to find this amazing musician. They don't want you to come in and fall on your face. And that's something that I've really tried to sort of keep in the forefront of my brain with everything I do, whether it has to do with music or not. Like people are rooting for you. I think that like if there are people who are just sitting there waiting for you to fail, like they're they aren't people that you even want in your universe anyway, and there's something wrong there. (laughs) So um, I think that, that you have to remember that in terms of singing. So moving past that to get to the question that you actually asked me and when kids come into the classroom and they are five years old, very, very rarely are they um, coming in with the idea that they can't sing. And to be quite honest with you, I don't give them the opportunity to even think about it because the way that I set up my classroom and the way that I pace things is in such a way where, first of all, I'm always singing. And second of all, when it's their turn to sing, it's it's not a, okay, Johnny, it is your turn now. Would you like to sing or would you not like to sing? It's not like that. It's like I echo sing to them like, hello, Johnny. And then I point to them. And if they don't respond, I move on. And then the next day I come back. And then the next day I come back. Because if a kid is resistant to singing in the first place, it's probably because they just are, it's because first of all, there's other kids in the room, right? And they need to see you sing more and they need to watch their friends do it more. And they need to find it in a fun way, like through a game or just quick, quick, quick with your pacing where they don't even have time to think of about it. And it's just what you do. And so that's sort of how I try to facilitate it in my class. And when the times that I notice that kids don't want to sing, it's usually because I'm trying to make a correction. And so that's, a tricky thing. So if I say like the hello Johnny thing that I just did, um, it's early, so I won't sing anymore. But <laughs> if I if I do that to Johnny and he sings back and he's not singing on pitch, and then I say, Oh, listen to my voice again, and then and do the same exercise again, and he shuts down because he, you know, kids are intuitive. They know that's like, oh, I didn't do that right. Then you still move on because they just need more time to explore. They need more time to experience what's going on in the classroom. So, so yes, I believe that every kid can sing. I think unless they have already had a horrible experience by the time that they're five, very rarely do I have an issue with kids at that age resisting to sing because so much of what happens in the classroom is game based. The pacing is quick, 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 and and they're down to party. Like they want to come into play. So um, if it means they can't play the game because they're not singing, they're going to make sure that they're singing. Now I have been in situations where I've gone to a new school or a new campus, and so the fourth graders and the fifth graders who are very preteen and way too cool for school come in and don't want to participate. And so that's when you have to start getting a little bit more creative because a lot of things have happened in terms of them being really, really aware of their peers, really, really aware of what other people are thinking or what's going to come up later. And so trying to find ways to to bring singing out of kids at that age is a little more difficult. And a lot of times what I do is I either use an activity that they want to do as a carrot that they're more comfortable because like older kids are more comfortable with instruments, right? So a lot of times what I'll say is like, okay, we're going to move to the instruments, but first we have to learn this song. And a lot of times that that will bring it out of them. So it's just sort of finding ways to, to make it a regular part of what you do if you're in a music teacher um, situation, if you are an adult musician listening today and singing is just like... I can't even think about doing that. It's just too much for me. I think like anything else, it gets easier the more that you do it. And so, you know, I'm a big proponent of stepping outside of your comfort zone. And, you know, I care a lot about what people think because I'm a people pleaser. But when it comes to trying something new, I don't care what people think because I'm going to try something new to better myself. And it might work. It might not work. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to learn from the experience. So. Fantastic. I, I think you've painted a great picture during this conversation of your approach to music education. And I think it will have given listeners a real sense of how rich and creative and enjoyable it can be in terms of, you know, singing first, understanding what you're doing, not just pressing buttons robotically, using games and activities and and having fun with it, exploring before you're worrying about transcribing, you know. And I, I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but You can be as brief or as lengthy as you like, but I'd love if you could just say from your perspective, you know, what 
what is the difference in terms of the musical results and the musical life of doing early music childhood education this way versus um, if we just call it the traditional way where it's very sheet music focused with recorders and singing from the staff? Yeah, kind of the old guard way, right? Um, and I don't, and you know, to say this. <laughs> so growing up, my music teacher, if for some reason she's she's out there listening, I have, you know, obviously it had some sort of impact on me because I remembered it. And everybody, you know, when people think about like, oh, I played the recorder, some people are like, oh, I love that recorder. I took it every day and I practiced it. You know, I mean, it was still a positive experience. But I think that, that, it's important to build those positive experiences. And, and, you know, I, I work and have worked in places where coming to school is, is sort of an escape for some kids. It's maybe nerve wracking for some kids. I mean, every, every kid's different. And I really like to think about the music room as a place where everybody can come in and just be a member of the community and really, really love what they're doing. Like, yes, they're learning, but they're learning through play like children should. Um, you know, they can't just, just sit and sit and read and sit and do this, that, or the other thing. And the music room it's my hope that most places the music room is a place where they come in and they can just feel like they belong and they feel like they really are musicians and they're doing things where they have a voice and where they can work with other people and have a voice. I also think that if you approach music education from the standpoint that I'm going to give kids the opportunity to explore and be their most musical selves and find as many ways as possible to sort of uncover that and tap into that for kids, that that not only gives them an appreciation for music, but hopefully gives them sort of that higher self-efficacy, that higher self, um, self-image self for, for other things as well. Like, oh, I tried this thing and it went really well and I really liked it. It makes me want to do more of this thing. So maybe that'll happen in this part of my life too, right? And and I mean, maybe that sounds a little too, is altruistic the word? <laughs> but, you know, everybody says like music makes everybody better. And I think that, you know, that it really does have that power because because of what of the way that you approach it in the community that you build in a classroom. And, you know, music teachers are an interesting breed because music teachers become, I like to say that music teachers become music teachers, not because they want to be teachers necessarily, but because they're musicians who want to bring something that's tapped into their lives to other people. Um, You know, so we're certainly not in it for the mad cash flow. (laughs) A lot of the time. So, I mean, not to say you can't make a living. I mean, that's a different podcast too. But anyway, so, um, but, but I think that that's why we're music teachers is something that, you know, musicians are an interesting breed too, because what they do is often their hobby, right? So, like, it really melds those two worlds. And, um, but what is the saying? Like, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life or whatever that is. And that's really and truly what I feel. I'm going off the rails with your question, but I think that it's important to, um, to build those those communities and to and to really give kids the opportunity to just come in and be and to create and and just have the opportunity to be musicians instead of be parrots i guess to really put it bluntly <laughs> which i think can can unfortunately be a little bit of a trap sometimes depending on the approach absolutely wonderful well i I think having heard you speak today, our listeners won't be shocked to hear that the tagline of your website is purposeful, sequential, joyful. I wonder if you could just tell us a bit about those three words, why you chose them, and what people can find on anacrusic.com and in the Anacrusic podcast. Oh, yeah. So so the whole reason that I came up with that was just because that those are sort of the the three things that I try to infuse in everything that I do. So the whole idea is that first of all, I don't see my kids very often. Um, and so a lot of times I um I want to make sure that everything that I'm doing in my classroom is really, really intentional. So if I only see my kids twice a week for 30 minutes, or you only have a music lesson once a week for 30 minutes, right? Like you don't want to waste a second of that. And that's why I mentioned like my pacing is always, um, even my transition from one activity to another has a really distinctive purpose. And so in order to find that purpose, there has to be a thoughtful sequence. So like what I was talking about with the micro and macro sequencing, um, 
um, that helps sort of streamline or align whatever my goals are for a classroom or a workshop or anything like that. And then obviously it needs to be joyful. I mean, I don't want, I don't want teachers that I'm working with or kids that I'm working with to come in and feel like it is such a drag. It's the, the, the last thing they want to be doing. I want it to be the best part of their day. And, you know, whether I'm working with teachers or I'm working with kids, you know, I greet them at the door. I say, I'm so happy that you're here. I mean, all of that is really, really important. So I always say, you know, find the purpose, find the purpose, be thoughtful with the sequence and choose joy. Because I think all three of those things are really sort of in, in your control. Like my husband likes to say, you are in charge of your own attitude. (laughs) And I I think that that's really true. And you're also in charge of how you want your classroom to sort of unfold. Um, And so and so being purposeful and sequential and joyful is sort of the decision that I've made about how I want everything that I, I do. To, to sort of work. And so, you know, I have um, my website and my podcast and my blog and some of the resources that I do are really intended for um, music teachers who are in a classroom setting. Um, and I work with teachers regularly with workshops, you know, here across the U.S. Um, and then I do teach some summer courses as well. But I am also always working with kids. So I work with the um, area youth chorus here in my town and um, a lot of the resources and things that I talk about on the podcast or on my blog stems from my experience with those kiddos. So, Terrific. Well, I, I've said it before on the show, but I'll say it again. Some of the best stuff online for learning music is where music teachers are talking to music teachers. So even if you yourself as a listener are not a music teacher, do definitely check out anacrusit.com and see what might be there that could help you in your own music learning journey. And I'm sure you're feeling inspired after listening to Anne today to, to find out more about her thoughts on these various topics. All that remains is to say a big thank you, Anne. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. And um, thank you for sharing so generously both of your own story and your expertise. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed it. The Musicality Podcast is brought to you by Musical U. Learn more at musical-u.com. One thing that's immediately clear, if you visit Anne's website, anacrusic.com, or you listen to her podcast, is that she is passionate about making music learning enjoyable and effective. She's very thoughtful about it, but with the aim of focusing on the true joyful creative spirit of music making. I think that's something special, and it came across throughout our conversation. Anne is well trained in the traditional approaches to musicality training which we've featured here on the podcast before, Kodai, Orff, Dalcroze, and music learning theory. But in fact, her own early music education was much more in the theory-based, sheet-music-heavy, play-what-you're-told-to tradition. She had a great experience of learning music and clearly developed a true passion for it, and so I thought it was really fascinating hearing her talk about the contrast between that approach and how she now teaches herself, and to draw out some of the advantages and limitations of the way she was herself taught. Anne grew up in a musical family, her father was a band director and composer, and she learned to play trumpet and piano, and also sang, including in choruses at a level where she was really expected to be a proper musician, even at a relatively young age. She said it was a a slightly curvy journey, including a big tangent when she decided to try something totally different as her major in college, but she then found her way back to majoring in music, and going on to study for a master's. To illustrate the kind of musician she was back then, Anne shared two stories of when her teachers challenged her that she wasn't really listening as she played. Her technique might have been good, but they could tell that she didn't truly have an internal oral model of what she was trying to express. Fortunately, she handled this critical feedback in a constructive way, rising to the challenge, and she also got some great encouragement from her performances along the way to keep her motivated. So, although she was conscious that there might be some skills of musicality that she was weaker in, she didn't see it as any kind of fundamental limitation, and I really liked how she talked about her strength in music as being a natural inclination rather than a natural talent. That inclination gave her the drive and focus to achieve what she set out to, whether it was the skills she'd been raised in, such as being a strong sight reader, or skills that were less familiar, like learning to improvise or overcoming stage fright. I asked Anne the big question of how each of the major music teaching philosophies she's versed in compare, Kodai, 
Aufschulwerk, Dalcroze, and music learning theory? That's obviously too huge a question to really try and answer in full in a podcast interview, but I asked it because I think for you, the listener, it's actually most valuable to hear the overall thoughts and opinions of a music educator like Anne, rather than a detailed point-by-point breakdown of how everything in music is covered by each of these approaches. So I hope you found it as interesting as I did to hear her talk through her experience and observations about each of them. I think the standout points were that, with Kodai, at least in the US, you're provided with much more pre-designed material. There are plenty of examples and guidance on how to introduce things step by step. The crux of it is to begin with repertoire, start from songs, and from there, build a learning sequence based around that music. Orff Schulwerk, by comparison is more heavily focused on creativity and how you can learn musical concepts through improvisation or other creative activities. She said Kodai is often seen as weighted towards reading and writing, but that's really up to the teacher, and it's perhaps just because the literacy material has been developed and is available ready-made for teachers to a greater extent. Dal Crows, as we've covered here on the show before, is a very movement-focused approach, using dance and body movement to internalize the musical concepts. Anne noted that this is something which can be polarizing. Some people love it immediately, while others are very nervous of that kind of expressive movement. So she sees it as a, a great tool in her toolbox. The fourth approach, music learning theory, she described as being very much about approaching music like a language, and so there's lots of learning to speak and listen before worrying too much about reading and writing. Ultimately, she said that all these approaches can work together, and it depends a lot on the teacher and the student and the situation to know which parts of which approach would be most useful. The more you as a teacher know, she said, the more you can do for your students. I asked Anne to explain the Kodai sequence of three Ps when teaching a new concept. Preparing, where you have musical experiences which feature that concept. Then presenting, where you're presented with the name to attach to that concept. And then practicing, where you really explore the concept to master it and connect it with new musical experiences. Sequencing is a big strength of Anne's. And it was a real pleasure to hear her talk through the various stages she'd be thinking about when teaching a new concept, and illustrate that for the case of teaching quarter and eighth note rhythms. As she pointed out, some traditional approaches would begin with the presenting, and then have the student try to connect that to some musical examples. It's a very intellectual and quite dry approach. But it can instead be a multi-stage process, which, I think her description demonstrated, can be truly musical from start to finish. I'd encourage you to think about this in your own music learning. Anne talked about macro-sequencing and micro-sequencing, and I think adult self-guided learners, we tend to think about the macro but not the micro, meaning we think about what course to take or what big skill we want to learn, but we probably don't spend enough time thinking about breaking that down and what each practice session should look like, or whether there are well-sequenced lessons out there designed by a pro, which could actually accelerate our learning and make it more fun. We talked about singing, a central skill both in the Kodai approach and early music education in general. This came up when talking about playing by ear and improvising too, when Anne shared the feedback she got from a teacher about how she wasn't hearing what she played. She said how singing can be the intermediate step before trying to do those things on an instrument, because it's a much more direct way for us to express our musical ideas, and so it can be the way we come to understand and explore and experiment. I loved the way she put her attitude to people thinking they can't sing, that she violently rejects it. And as you'll know if you're a long-time listener to this show, that's how I feel myself, and it was really interesting to hear how she approaches things with her five-year-olds, as well as with the teenagers who maybe come to it with more psychological baggage around singing. Anne shared the story of having a bad experience with stage fright as a singer early on, but fortunately, some encouraging words from a stranger helped her to continue on rather than being put off. Hearing Anne talk about making singing a natural part of music learning from the outset and throughout, making it a game, keeping things moving so fast that singing just happens without too much conscious concern, 
It made me think about how, although as adults we aren't a blank slate in the same way that maybe the five-year-olds are, we do have a big advantage over them, and over the teenagers too. We at this stage have enough self-awareness that we can recognise the part of our brain that's got hang-ups about singing, and creates negative mental chatter, and we can consciously actively choose to do it anyway. We can decide to adopt the game-like mentality, the just try it and then move on, instead of letting ourselves be paralysed by self-consciousness or fear of appearing imperfect. I think that's a really valuable lesson we can take away from how Anne approaches getting her students singing. Speaking of perfection and being self-conscious, a recurring theme in our conversation was the importance of feedback, such as in the classroom with young children when they need to be corrected on something, and also in Anne's own musical journey. The critical feedback that helps you to grow and improve, and the positive feedback that encourages you to continue. I was reminded of our recent interview with Josh Plotner talking about putting the ego aside, when Anne said that she is very conscious of what other people think of her, except when trying something new, because there she's doing it to grow and improve. What a fantastic mindset to have. The tagline of Anne's website and podcast is Purposeful, Sequential, Joyful. And I think some of the comments in this conversation about joy and having fun and playing games and expressing your own musical self, if you heard them in isolation, you might think it was a, a slightly hippieish approach to music education where having fun is all that matters. But I'm sure hearing them in context, you saw the same thing I did, which is that Anne, like ourselves at Musical U, is all about the specific, concrete, practical skills of music, as well as the enjoyment. Joy is actually the root to good learning, not an alternative to it. There are some terrific resources on anacruzic.com and in the Anacruzic podcast. That's Anacruzic spelt A-N-A-C-R-U-S-I-C. So do check those out for much more thoughtful insight and guidance from Anne on sequencing, musicianship skills, and more. I've been really impressed by her approach and expertise, and I'm hoping we can tempt her to come give a masterclass or provide some training for our members at Musical U soon. Check out the links to Anne's website and other resources in the show notes for this episode at musicalitypodcast.com. Thanks for listening to this episode, and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content. Ex-